we live in difficult times almost every day we hear of some environmental calamity across our country sometimes it is the landslides in vinad or the floods reported across the country from so many states this year such as uttarakhand himachal manipur meghalaya everywhere we hear of hundreds of lives lost and thousands impacted and displaced there was a terrible heat stroke across the country this year the highest temperature was reported in churu in rajasthan of 50.5 degrees centigrade which was the highest in india for the last 8 years 40000 people were reported to have suffered from heat stroke across the country bangalore and chennai were inundated there were reports of kaziranga being inundated by the brahmaputra and as many as 200 100 tragic deaths of wild animals which also included endangered rhinos took place i came from delhi yesterday morning walking through was like breathing through a chimney it was that bad have you checked the air um, quotient index in delhi in this winter it has crossed the severe mark many many times and on 18th of november we created history we were the most polluted city in the world having crossed an aiq of 1500 a local clinic in delhi reported that 60% of the cases were related to pollution and the most impacted were the children and the elderly now we know that quite a bit of it is related to our forests and forest fragmentation now what happens when we lose our forests we find that when we lose our forests the habitats become reduced the number of habitats also become reduced the sizes also get reduced and what increases is the patches the number of patches that are there as well as the isolation of these patches from each other and how does it impact our habitats it increases human wildlife conflict it increases species decimation it also increases in lot of road kills and rail kills also which we keep hearing very often we also find that the forests once they are reduced or when they are being uh, fragmented they lose their ability gravely to provide for the ecosystem services which is so essential for human uh, um, uh, survival we find that its ability to sequester carbon to purify air water and to uh, stall soil erosion as well as provide us with good agriculture these are all diminished on which human being and human life is completely dependent on if we spoil our forests and decimate them it's a very stark future that we are facing for our human kind is this the development that we are marching towards is this the future we envisage for ourselves and our children i am sure the answer will be a resounding no if you even ask a layman what are the causes of these problems they will be an unequivocal answer that it is cutting of our forests it is climate change it is pollution excessive uh, burning of our fossil fuels unbridled construction all these will come out as the responses so therefore most of us know what are the causes of the problem but we do not want to actually stem this rot and stop this destruction from taking place and therein lies the conundrum and this brings me to the forest conservation amendment act which was enacted last year and i would like to explain in simple words what this enactment means and how we could have also taken different steps to ensure that our ecological security had been retained and we should have become a more healthy environmentally healthy uh, country as well as the whole world becoming more envi uh, environmentally healthy so let me start from how uh, our forests have evolved uh, historically once uh, independence took place forests were a state subject the states controlled their protection or their diversion and it was seen that after independence between and by 1980 as many as 4.3 million hectares of forests were destroyed 
and they were diverted for various uses such as dams, mines, infrastructure, real estate development, you name it and it was all diverted. Alarmed at this situation, the centre brought in the Forest Conservation, I mean, uh, Fund Conservation Act of 1980 and uh, it also brought in the forests as into the concurrent list. Now what in 1976, what this concurrent list means that for forests the legislation could be done by the state as well as the centre but in case of any sort of a conflict between the central and the state government legislation, the central government legislation would have precedence. Now after the 1976 bringing it into the concurrent list, the 1980 Act which I was telling you about, a Forest Conservation Act was implemented and the principal point of this particular act was that in the states could not divert forest lands unilaterally. If there was a diversion that had to be done or it was propounded by the state, it had to have concurrence of the central government. And for that, there was an advisory committee formed and this advisory committee comprised of experts, scientists, bureaucrats with domain knowledge and it was called the Forest Advisory Committee. Only on once their approval was given that a forest could be diverted. Then uh, after that it was seen that as much as uh, 1.5 million hectares alone was diverted after independence, uh, after the 1980 Act till date, showing that it was an, a very important act and it was had a lot of meaning. But there were other forests which were with other agencies such as the revenue department or any other type of uh, um, uh, control that was there over the forest. Con and these were already, these were being diverted by the state governments without the oversight of the central government. Understanding this lacuna, the Supreme Court in 1996 came up with an order which is commonly known as the Godavarman order. And this Godavarman order said that it is not enough that they are notified forests, you have to identify forests as per the dictionary meaning and irrespective of ownership, all these forests will be considered to be forests and any diversion of these forests will require the central government concurrence for it. It went a step further and said that you need, you set up each state and union territory sets up a state expert committee and this state expert committee will identify all these forests and make an inventory of these forests. But what was to be seen is that these forests, the state expert committees did not come up with a very good inventory and the reports were quite sketchy. And revenue forests, which are also called unclassed forests or deemed forests, were mostly left out and they were unrecorded also. Now what uh, was the outcome of this is that the Adhinium, which I have talked about, the Forest Conservation Amendment Act, said that any area which has not been identified as a forest by the government including the state expert committee, they will no longer be under the purview of this amended act, which happened in 2023. It was called the Van Samrakshanam Evam uh, um, Samvidhan Adhinyam. So it's a difficult one to pronounce, but anyway, I'll call it the Adhinyam from now onwards. So this Adhinyam said that all these areas which were not recorded fall out of the purview of the amended act. Now you can imagine what a vast area comes out of the purview and can be diverted by the state government without any uh, uh, scrutiny of the central government and it just falls off the grid. So much so that it is seen that about 27% of forests are unrecorded forests or such type of forests which have not been taken into account and they will no longer have any scrutiny and can be diverted as such. It amounts to be around 1,97,000 square kilometers. So you can imagine the vast area of forest that will completely fall off the grid and can be used for all diversion purposes without scrutiny. Now, I can just give one example of uh, which you may have heard in Munar. There is a place called Chinna Canal where there is a huge human elephant conflict going on. This area should have been identified way back in 1997 as per the Godavarman order and protected as such. They didn't do it. They didn't bring it into the fold of conservation. And now there is, it is overrun by a lot of uh, tourism facilities and it is right in the way of the elephant pathway. So you can imagine elephant-human conflict is but natural. And uh, there was an elephant called Ari Komban. Ari in uh, uh, Malayalam means uh, rice and Komban is an elephant. And that used to go from house to house and shop to shop and uh, raid uh, raw rice and take it away. 
Now, considering this elephant, it was decided to take the uh, this Arikomban and put it into Kanyakumari forest, which is now there very tragically. But this conflict still continues; it has not abated. So, how many elephants are we going to remove? So, is it not easier to remove the infrastructure rather than remove elephants and ensure that there is so much of conflict? So, this is what is going to happen because of our uh, amended act also. Now, the other part that is there, uh, which I'll quickly tell you, the uh, that we are go uh, going to a very scary pre-1980 scenario, where we find that uh, many types of forests can be diverted at the state level itself. For example, if a road is running or a rail is there, and there is an amenity supposed to be on the side of the road or ra 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 road, then in that case, up to 0.1 hectares can be diverted by the state government without any scrutiny to access the amenity or the habitation. Similarly, uh, for international boundaries, uh, up to 100 kilometers for defence strategic linear projects lands can be diverted again without scrutiny. The same is the case for almost every forest across the country where 10 hectares in the name of strategic uh, the, the security installations can be diverted anywhere and 5 hectares for left wing extremism notified areas can also be diverted. So now you can imagine that it's going to end up in pockmarking our whole forest and you're going to have islands of degradation. On top of this, the number is not specified. What is the upper limit of uh, these diversions that can be done is not specified. So you can have any number of such diversions taking place. Besides that, what is defined by security installations, strategic linear um, uh, projects is also not mentioned. So it is open to interpretation. Anything can be done in the name of these particular types of uh, uh, infrastructure and you can imagine the type of destruction that will take place. And the uh, sad part of it is that in this case, only a DFO accepts the proposal. A DFO is an uh, uh, officer at the uh, district level, uh, a lower functionary us usually, an IFS officer maybe. Uh, but he accepts the proposal. It is vetted through uh, the nodal officer within the forest department and a final approval is given by the uh, PCCF and the HOF that is the head of the department. So you can see it's completely in-house. and. Therefore, you can imagine the type of pressures that are going to be there and how easily it will be uh, for uh, diversions to take place. Where it was that the FAC, uh, you know, vets all these proposals and here it is done in-house and given away. So the type of scary situation that is going to come is can only be imagined and can only be envisaged from it. Also, one more thing that these all these forests that are there, they can do any number of surveys if it does not involve cutting of trees, except for mining. So if you want to have a hydroelectric project or you want to have a, a rail line or a transmission line, you can do a, go and do a survey and do an innumerable number of surveys. So now what is the message are we spreading through that? That all our forests are open for exploitation and there is no forest which is sacrosanct for conservation. So that's how we are viewing our forests in future. Let me come to a very important aspect called the compensatory afforestation. Now, compensatory afforestation is being touted by, uh, um, by the agencies, saying that this is the way that we will uh, meet our targets of uh, uh, net zero emissions by 2070. But what is it, uh, actually the intricacies of it, that when you divert a forest, a natural forest, for a non-forestry activity, you have to give, the user agency has to give an equal area of non-forest land which now comes into the forest bank. But what is happening is many times this particular uh, 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 land for land uh, exchange is not happening and it's they are getting away with just paying money and allowing uh, this uh, uh, forest to be diverted. So now you can imagine slowly you will find that our forests are shrinking and one day it will dwindle to that extent that it, there is almost nothing left. Besides that, it is against the national forest policy, which envisages that 33.3% in plains and 66.6% .6 in the hills should be retained as forests. So you can imagine all this is adding to the dwindling of our forest and our ecological security being uh, uh, lowered. And also please understand that 
there is no replacement for old growth forests. The ecological uh, values, the carbon sequestration, uh, the sort of pu uh, purifying of our air and water can only be done by old growth forests and plantations are not an uh, answer to it because they are usually monocultures, they are fast growing, they do not have the ecological uh, interactions with other species. They are money guzzlers and with poor uh, outcomes also. So this is what our compensatory afforestation is doing and this is what our adhenium is projecting as one of the ways that we will achieve net zero emission also. So let me now come to, there are other parts of it also, I will just say it very briefly that this uh, adhenium allows for a lot of um, uh, oil palms that can be grown especially in the northeast by lowering of the standards. Please do read about it. It also tries to say that the way forward is to provide employment is through creating more zoos and safaris. We know the type of waste that is created, the type of uh, degradation that happens. So this is probably not the way forward. And also it says that the rules uh, can be made by the executive itself without the oversight of the parliament. Believe me, this is draconian. If there is no oversight, then the present administration can do whatever they feel like, which can be very detrimental to conservation. So let me come to uh, what could have been done or what should have been done. And for that I will say that probably we should have followed the Godavarman order in letter and spirit, we can still do it. We have so much of technology that we can find out what our forests were like in 1996 itself. We can try to get them back, try to ensure that maximum of them go back into the, into the fold of forests, they get notified and they are protected. We should reduce the amount of diversions that are taking place. In fact, we should put a moratorium on all types of diversions. Besides that, any diversion, if has, it has to be done, should be done only with the central government concurrence by the scientific advisory that is watching over these type of diversions. And then after that, we should take back all the mined areas which the leases have expired. We know the extent of damage that mining does and many of uh, many uh, illegalities happen. We should take it back and reforest it and reclaim these lands. So th uh, these are the ways that we can ensure that our forests come back. And one more thing I want to say on this point is that we should try to ensure that instead of going and destroying more forests in the name of infrastructure, the existing infrastructure, the in existing, uh, you know, um, the diversions that have happened already, we should try to uh, optimize them, modernize them and make them relevant so that they would work for our uh, people and we would not need to divert more forests. Let me end it on a very positive note that we are seeing that there is a uh, going back to conservation and there is a citizens movement across the USA and especially Europe where many riparian uh, uh, ecosystems are being uh, uh, you know re-established. In uh, USA for example there is an Elva dam which was uh, removed and it is seen that after the removal of this dam there was uh, the salmon population came back, the uh, wildlife populations recovered. The same is in uh, the Garden River in Denmark, it was seen that uh, after uh, restoration, the flood plains became more uh, healthy. And the same, there, there was a, a dam in France, the uh, Maison uh, Rouge Dam, after it was removed, there has been recovery of the salmon populations and other wildlife. We also have our Indian homegrown examples, startling and sparkling examples really. The tiger population increase is such a government-led program which has shown so much of recovery. The same is for uh, rhinos, it has come back from the brink of extinction. Our folk, uh, Amur falcon, which is in Nagaland and, these, uh, and uh, the other northeast areas, they used to be poached so much. They have all been drastically stopped and the populations have recovered and they are coming back. So we have our own examples to show that when we have the intent, we know how to make it happen. We know how to walk the talk and that is the need of this art and we should do it. And uh, let me end uh, finally by saying that it should be a citizen-led movement because unless the citizens put pressure, nothing is really going to happen. And everyone should get together, the bureaucrats, the politicians, everyone should get together and we should become the international leaders in conservation and how we have recovered our uh, wild spaces and our habitats, that should be the way forward. And not an ecologically dystopian future that is facing us right now. Let us, the choice is ours, we can choose hope and we can choose life. Thank you.